What is going on, everyone? This is Eric coming at you live from just outside of Hartford, Connecticut. And today we'll be discussing the history of the Cleveland Major League Baseball team known as the Cleveland Indians. Now, we will not be discussing the Cleveland Spiders as they were a franchise before the Indians. That would be a different video if we were to get into that one. If that's something that interests you guys, please definitely let me know. Um, seeing as the team folded, they will not be included in the history of at this time. But if you are interested in the Cleveland Spiders, definitely let me know in the comments and I will make it happen. But without further ado, we're going to jump into the team of, you know, the history of the Cleveland Indians. So this team was founded in the year of 1894, and they were in the Western League, which was a minor league affiliate to the National League at that time. And they were actually known as the Grand Rapids Rustlers at that time. So they were in Grand Rapids, Michigan, not Cleveland, Ohio at that point. So they would play in the Western League, which of course was a minor league, for, you know, through 1899. Then the Western League would change and become the American League. Now, in the year of 1900, that's when that happened. And the American League was a minor league affiliate at that point. And when they became the American League, the uh, Grand Rapids Rustlers moved to Cleveland and they changed their name to the Cleveland Lake Shores. So, yeah, not, not an attractive name at all. Um, in 1901, as we know, the American League would officially become a competing major league with the National League. And Cleveland was a founding member at that time. Now, prior to the 1901 season, they became the Bluebirds instead of the Lake Shores. And they would play their games at League Park in Cleveland. So nobody fans, players, nobody really liked the nickname Bluebirds. So the writers, you know, sports writers would commonly refer to them as the Blues. But, you know, the players didn't like this. And they said no. And, you know... So in 1902, basically the players had basic, um, went after and said, hey, we need to change this name. So they tried to make the name Broncos. And it didn't officially stick, but if you look in the record books, you will see them mentioned as the Broncos. You'll see them mentioned as the Blues and the Bluebirds. It's just kind of a mess. Um, officially, I was looking at baseball reference. They did refer to them as the Broncos. So at this point, they were the Cleveland Broncos as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the team was considering relocating to either Cincinnati, obviously in Ohio, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, after struggling to make money early on in its existence here in Cleveland. And in June of 1902, however, the team acquired second baseman Napoleon Knapp LaJoy from the Philadelphia Athletics. Now, they had acquired Knapp LaJoy from the Athletics because the Athletics uh, owner at the time had, make, had been borrowing money. He needed money to stay afloat, and the Cleveland owner had a lot of money at that point. So he was giving money to a lot of different teams to keep them afloat. And in response, you know, the athletics were like, oh, well, you know what? We'll, uh, we'll do you a favor because the Napa Joy story is a weird one. But basically, he had played for the Phillies. And then the Phillies couldn't offer him. There's a cap for how much money a National League team could offer a player. He felt he was worth more. The Phillies couldn't give it to him. The Phillies didn't want to give it to him because their owner was cheap. So he left. He said, I'm going to the American League. He went to the American League. The athletics were able to give him more money. And then a court order came out that he wasn't allowed to play in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So that's why the Athletics traded him because they couldn't, you know, it makes no sense to keep a guy that you can only play, you know, half the time. You can only use him. And it, it just, it didn't add up for them. So um, Nap Joy was nicknamed the Frenchman because obviously Napoleon, his first name is pretty obvious that he's French. And um, he was arguably the biggest name in Major League Baseball at this time. So his arrival actually helps jumpstart the franchise in Cleveland. So after the 1902 season, the fans would actually vote to change the team's name to the Naps in honor of their newfound leader, Napoleon LaJoy, or Nap LaJoy. Um, in 1905, Nap LaJoy would, became, would become the team's manager. And the team was okay. They weren't dominant by any stretch of the means, but they weren't bad. So in 1908, they actually finished half a game out of a pennant. Now, you might be wondering how that's possible. If there was a rain out, you know, it was just canceled unless it was needed to be played. So they like that's what would happen. If you couldn't make a game, they didn't make you play it. Like if you look back at these old days, you'll find a team that played like three or four games less than another team. So that's basically what it was, you know, uh, rain out, weather delays, you couldn't get, you know, you missed the team bus or whatever. Random stuff like that. 
So prior to the 1909 season, the team would actually acquire pitcher Cy Young. Now, at this point, Cy Young's not what he was. He's older. He's losing his uh, gifts. So he, he was just kind of a commodity at this point. Um, if you, We will be doing a player bio on him, but he did start his career in Cleveland on the Cleveland Spiders. Just a little side note on him. Um, so after, during the 1909 season, Napa Joy would actually resign as manager because he didn't want the responsibility of it, but he did hang around as a player. So the team did not win any pennants in the 1900s. Now we get to the 1910s, and prior to the 1910 season, the team would acquire outfielder Shoeless Joe Jackson, again, a guy who would be getting a player bio, um, from the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Athletics. And then we have a little bit of a tragic story here. Um, during April of 1911, a pitcher on the team named Addy Joss, Addy Joss would actually die from a tubercular meningitis. So just a little rude awakening for the team. Um, Cleveland kind of suffered from it, but not a lot. Um, after the 1911 season, Cy Young would retire effectively from baseball. He had a horrible 1911 season. Um, the last eight batters he faced all got hits off him, just to tell you how bad he had gotten at that point. So uh, the team was strong on offense, but weak when it came to pitching in the early parts of the decade, obviously losing a pitcher in his prime to tubercular meningitis and then having Cy Young get beaten up time after time hurts you. So in 1914, the team went 51 and 102. So after the season, the team would actually trade second baseman Napa Joy back to the Philadelphia Athletics as the court order had been waived, so he was allowed to return and play in the Commonwealth. And, you know, at this point, he was past his prime. He had an average of, like, 260 or 250. And people were like, oh, he's done. He's washed up. Nowadays, a 260 average is pretty respectable. But, you know, back then, different game. So with Nap gone, the team obviously needed a new name. And, uh, you know, because you can't name your team after a guy who's on another team. After, yeah. So, uh Ownership would ask local baseball writers for name suggestions, and based on their input, they would call the team the Cleveland Indians. Now, a common misconception is that the team was actually named after a former Cleveland Spider outfielder, Luis Sacalas. Um, so basically, Sacalas uh, was a Native American, and he played in the team. He played in Cleveland for three years, but this isn't true. Um, it was never credited. You know, it's just kind of a rumor that makes it more justifiable to call your team the Indians. Um, obviously, that name has a lot of controversy with it even today, especially right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. They actually uh, they tweeted recently, I think it was either July 3rd or 4th, that they were going to look into their name. Um, I don't think they're going to change it, but it's possible. That's a story for another day. But um, so basically, um, the real story behind it comes from a sports writer named uh, Joe Tosnatsky. Tosnatsky. And he said, quote, why exactly would people in Cleveland, this in a time when Native Americans were generally viewed as subhuman in America, name their team after a relatively minor and certainly troubled outfielder, end quote. So he basically says, you know, why would they name their team after this guy? Why would they want to honor him when he spent three years on the team and only played in like 87 games or something like that? And, you know, the fans were brutal to him. So, oh, he played 96 games. My apologies. Um, and, you know, the fans, whenever he was out there, they would taunt him. They would whoop. They would holler. You know, just things that they would do, especially when, like, you'll see it again when Jackie Robinson makes his debut. Um, fans were just brutal to him. So, instead, the nickname was chosen for the fact that, quote, fun that it would inspire in the crowds, end quote. That's from a newspaper at the time. There's not a lot of sources that tell you exactly why the team name was chosen. That's one of them. So in other words, they wanted the fans to have fun. They wanted their fans, you know, they wanted to encourage the fans to go out, have a few beers, and just start uh, taunting other teams, you know, whooping, crying, you know, doing whatever they wanted to do, mocking Native Americans. That's why this team name is controversial to date. Not a lot of people know that story. I wanted to include it and just kind of break it down for you guys. All right, off of that, so in August of 1915, the team would trade outfielder Shula Show Jackson to the White Sox, as we know from our previous Chicago White Sox history video. So they made some moves prior to the 1916 season. So they would acquire outfielder uh, Trish Speaker 
and they would officially call up pitcher Stan Kowalski. So, you know, these were two bigger names for them. And the team responds well to these acquisitions, specifically the Trish Speakers move. And uh, they would actually climb out of the AL's basement pretty quickly. They finished third in the American League in the 1917 season, followed by back-to-back second-place finishes in 1918 and 1919. Keep in mind, the 1918 season was war shortened due to the strike, or sorry, the 1919 season was shortened due to the uh, World War I. So Tris Speaker would become a player and manager midway through the 1919 season. No pennants in the 1910s. Now we get to the 1920s. And the team had a nice start in 1920. And a tragic moment would occur in August, on August 16th, 1920, in a game against New York Yankees. So uh, the Cleveland shortstop, Ray Chapman, was up to bat. And he was known as a guy who would always crowd the plate. So he'd always be really close to the plate. And um, it was the late afternoon, so the infield was in a shadow, and the batter's eye, which is obviously center field, was bathed in sunlight. So, you know, there was already problems. And at this time, it was legal and encouraged to, in common practice, to, like, you know, dirty up the baseball, you know, spit on it and rub it in the dirt or get some pine tar, um, tobacco juice, liquor, fresh licorice probably put liquor on it if you really wanted to too um they would also intentionally cut up the baseball use sandpaper put spikes on it whatever they could do so the pitchers had an edge and the end result's a deformed baseball so it doesn't go exactly where you want it to go at all times so what ends up happening is chapman winds up getting hit in the head because he didn't have time to react and this is a time before helmets were mandatory or even worn so the, the hit fractures his skull, and he ends up dying hours later in the hospital. So his death would obviously lead to Major League Baseball banning the spitball and eventually would help lead to helmets becoming mandatory, but helmets didn't become mandatory for another 20 or 30 years. So, you know, it, it just goes to show you. At least they banned the spitball. That was the one thing that came out of it. Um, so the team would hang into a close race in the AL through the 20, 1920 season, and they took advantage of the Black Sox scandal as it came to light, and they would win the American League for the first time in 1920, booking their first trip to the World Series. So they would face the, the uh, Brooklyn Robins in the World Series, and they would defeat them five games to two in a best-of-nine series to win the, C- the organization's first World Series title. So in Game 5 of the World Series, we had an interesting moment. Um, Cleveland, sec- Cleveland second baseman Bill Wam- Wamgans, sorry, Bill Wamgans um, would actually execute an unassisted triple game, triple play, which is the only one to date in World Series history. So the team would finish second in the American League in 1921 and would slowly begin to decline due to their aging core. Um, and the New York Yankees dynasty. The Yankees dynasty really screws over a lot of these teams. Um, you know, obviously the White Sox got hit, Tigers got hit, Cleveland's getting hit. It, you'll see, you'll see in future videos, don't worry. Um, so in June of 1922, their owner, James Dunn, would actually die from influenza. So his widow inherited the team, and she had minimal interest. She didn't really want to run the team. So... Um, the team begins to slip towards the basement by, you know, 1924. And Stan uh, Kowalski is traded after the 1926 season. So the team has a strong season in uh, 1928. And they actually would only finish three games out of the AL pennant. Oh, sorry, 1926. Yeah, 1926, not 28, sorry. And uh, Tris Speaker would retire after the 1926 season. But um, he would end up coming back to baseball, and he would play for other teams other than Cleveland. So he just – he officially retired, but then he came back. He got offered money, and he said, okay, I'll come back. So um, the team would fall off in the 1927 season, and the franchise was sold in 1927. So in 1928, pitcher Mel Harder would make his MLB debut, and the team would end the decade in, with a respectable third-place finish in the American League. So they won one AL pennant in the 1920s, and they would win that World Series, the 1920 World Series. So now we get to the 1930s, and the team was an average team throughout the 30s, finishing third or fourth 
nine times out of ten in the uh, decade in the American League. So in 1932, the team would move to the newly constructed uh, Cleveland Stadium. Um, after the 1933 season, attendance troubles in the large outfield co combined to cause the team to return to League Park. So basically, remember, this is the Great Depression time. So people aren't going to spend money to go to a baseball game. And, you know, this new stadium, Cleveland Stadium, had a gigantic outfield. So you wouldn't see as many hits. You wouldn't see as many home runs. So people that weren't excited to go there. So they returned to League Park because it was smaller, easier to manage, all that good stuff. Um, so now we get to, like I said, the Great Depression. Team's ownership really starts to deal with some changes. And 45% of the team's ownership would change hands. Um, a pair of brothers around had owned a chunk of the team. They had to sell it because they had a lot of money in the railroad industry. And that obviously with the Great Depression fell off. So a lot of just the team just ended up changing hands. So in 1936, pitcher Bob Feller would make his MLB debut. And then in 1937, the team would return to Cleveland Stadium for selected games and would eventually make Cleveland Stadium its home again in a few years. So in late 1937, defensive stud Ken Keltner would make his debut for the team. He was a really good defensive third baseman. Um, in late 1938, shortstop Lou Bordreau would make his debut for the team. And now it's obvious that the team has a solid foundation in place to close out the decade. They did not win any pennants in the 30s, though. So now we get to the 40s. And the team had a strong 1940 season. Um, they found themselves matched up with Detroit for the, in the last game of the 1940 season in a must win. So Cleveland was led by star pitcher Bob Feller, and Detroit was led by a complete no-name pitcher who literally played one game his MLB career. And somehow this guy outpitched Hall of Fame pitcher Bob Feller, and the Tigers would win that game in a defensive battle. So Detroit would win the AL pennant in 1940. Um, in 1941, pitcher Bob Lemon would make his debut for the team. And the team was unable to replicate its success in 1941. Now, two days after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, so December 9th, 1941, um, pitcher Bob Feller would actually enlist in the U.S. Navy. Now, basically what happened was he visited – his dad was in a nursing home at this point. He visits his dad, and it becomes apparent to him. He's like, okay, I think the right thing to do is go fight. He's the first professional athlete in the United States to enlist in World War II. So it's just a little interesting side fact there. Um, you'll hear about it later in the week, though. Hint, hint. Um, so despite losing their ace pitcher at this point, Cleveland played well in the 42 and 43 seasons. But in, 40, in 1944, they would struggle and slump below 500. So Ken, uh, third baseman Ken Keltner was drafted prior to the 1945 season, so he had to go fight overseas, so the team lost him. In, in late 1945, Bob Feller would return from overseas. Um, so in 1946, Ken Keltner would return to the team. And after the 1946 season, the team was sold to a new ownership group that was headlined by Bill Vec, who we've mentioned before in the White Sox video. Um, this group also contained celebrity Bob Hope and former Detroit Tigers legend uh, Hank Greenberg. So Greenberg has an interesting story. He kind of flip, uh, hangs around the team here and there, and he ends up basically getting kicked out of the team because he tries to move the team, and fans found out, and he took full responsibility for it. Um, it's, just, it's just a mess for him, but... So they would move to Cleveland Stadium full-time in 1947, so they played part-time there for a decade. So in 1947, the team would acquire outfielder Larry Doby. Um, so Doby would become Major League Baseball's second black player and the first one to play in the American League. He debuted about three months after Jackie Robinson made his debut. So just a little interesting story there. Um, Bill Veck was very, very progressive in that, in that stand. You'll see what I mean in a little bit. Too. So after the 1947 season, um, pitcher Mel Harder would retire. And Major League Baseball actually had to make a new rule in, after the 1947 season because of Cleveland. So their owner, Bill Veck, um, he could definitely get his own bio video. If that's something that interests you guys, let me know. Um, so he had this great idea to put a uh, portable fence in center field. Because remember, 
Cleveland Stadium is a gigantic outfield. So he put the, the portable fence in center field, and he would move the fence in or out by as much as 15 feet before series, depending on how it would help Cleveland. So if a team had a lot of power hitters, they'd move the fence back. If they had a lot of weak hitters and a bad defender, you know, you'd move the fence back. If you had a lot of weak hitters, you'd move it forward, you know. You would just do whatever you could to help your team. And the rule that uh, Major League Baseball made was you had to keep the distance of the outfield wall the same throughout the whole season. So you could move the wall, you could move the center field wall in if you wanted to, but you'd have to do it after the season. And you'd have to let the league know the distance and they'd have the right to measure it. So just a little side note there, you know, about Bill Beck being Bill Beck. So in July of 1948, the team would sign pitcher Satchel Paige from the Negro Leagues. Uh, again, you know, a progressive move by Bill Beck. Um, so he actually would make his debut at the age of 42. So he's the oldest rookie in MLB history. And the team was led by a strong offense that year in 1948. They would win their second AL pennant. Now, they went on to win the World Series over the Boston Braves. So now, after or before the 1949 season, they would acquire a pitcher early win. But Cleveland would fall to third place in the 1949 season. In late 1949, unfortunately, Bill Veck had to sell the team. Um, he was going through a divorce, and he didn't have the money to pay you know, his ex-wife at this point, half of his assets, so he had to sell the team. Um, so basically what happens is third baseman Ken Keltner is released after this, and uh, pitcher Satchel Paige is also released. For whatever reason, nobody really liked Paige. Um, he had an attitude because, you know, he was an older African-American who had been discriminated against, and he would sign with Bill Veck when Bill Veck er purchased another team in the future. So in the 1940s, the Cleveland uh, franchise won one AL pennant, and they won that World Series 1948. Now we get to 1950s, and they would finish fourth place in a strong AL in the 1950 season, despite having 92 wins. That's how strong the American League was that year. So after that season, uh, they would release uh, shortstop Lou Boudreau, and from 1951 to 1953, the Tribe, as they're nicknamed, would actually play second fiddle to the American League to the Yankees dynasty again they finished second in all three years so they were good but the Yankees were better um in 1954 the team had the franchise's most winningest season as the club went 111 and 73 um with a 721 winning percentage this actually set the AL record for wins which stood for 44 years and winning percentage which stands to date so that was the best winning percentage season in American League history so they would face off against the New York Giants in the World Series. And this is the World Series in which Willie Mays makes his famous over-the-shoulder over the catch in Game 1. Um, the Giants were too much for the Cleveland franchise, and they swept them. So. so they would again finish second in the American League in 1955. And they would trade Larry Doby to the White Sox after that 55 season. So following an ineffective 50, 1956 season, Pitcher Bob Feller would retire from playing. Interestingly enough, like they basically told him, if you don't retire, we're going to have to release you. We don't want to do that. Um, so he retires and gets a front office role with the team. Um, outfielder Roger Maris would make his MLB debut for the team in April of 1957. And the team would struggle that year in 1957, finishing sixth in the AL. So they would hire GM Frank Trader Lane who I will refer to as Trader Lane from here on out after that season. And he would trade pitcher early win after that, after the 57 season. So in June of 1958, he would trade outfielder Roger Maris to the Kansas City Athletics. Um, Trader Lane was known for making trades. Like he would just trade all these people all the time. He made so many trades, it was ridiculous. So pitcher Bob Lemon would retire after or before the 1959 season. He basically went in there. He was going to come out in the bullpen and be a relief pitcher, but he felt that he was too old, so he just kind of said, I'm done. I retire. Um, they would acquire outfielder Norm Cash in December of 1959, but again, Trader Lane would flip him to Detroit before the 1960 season for a player that didn't do anything for the team. He spent one year in Cleveland. Um, Bad trade for them, and just shows you a lot. 
So in the 1950s, the uh, team made one trip to the World Series and they lost. So now we get to the 1960s. And just before the 1960 season, as I said, you know, there was a trade there with Norm Cash. And he also would trade, uh, GM Trader Twain would also trade a fan favorite outfielder named Rocky Polavita to the Detroit Tigers for outfielder Harvey Kuhn. So Kuhn would only play one season in Cleveland. And after this trade, you know, Cleveland entered a stretch of bad baseball. So this is known as the curse of Rocky Colvito. Now, interestingly enough, Colvito basically said he had no ill will with the franchise, but his name's just stuck to this curse. So, um, so GM Trader Lane would actually leave the team in early 1961 to get a new job. And ownership woes began to plague the franchise in the 60s. So, you know, they didn't have consistent ownership. And the owners that they had didn't have the money to actually respect the team, give the team what it needed. So in 1963, pitcher Tommy John would make his debut. Yes, the same Tommy John from Tommy John surgery. Um, during the 1964 season, pitcher Luis Tiant would make his MLB debut. After the 64 season, they would actually trade pitcher Tommy John away. Now, the guy who took over after Trader Lane was actually another trading GM, just not as much as Trader Lane. So the team would almost move to the city of Seattle after the 1964 season. But the problem was they basically were ready to put pen to paper, but the city of Seattle could not promise the team a, a stadium until 1970 at the earliest. So they would have had to play in a minor league stadium from 1965 to 1969 at minimum. They didn't want that. So they stayed in Cleveland. And in 1966, the team was sold to Vernon Stouffer. Now, Stouffer is the one who was responsible for the frozen food empire there of Stouffer's. I know they make all the lasagna and stuff like that. Um, so Stouffer, he had money from, you know, his company. And the parent company that owns Stouffer's, their stock begins to plummet. And that means uh, Stouffer doesn't have the money. So they have to slash player development, which would set back the team for a while. You know, all of a sudden, you can't scout as much. You lose a lot of your scouting players and all that good stuff. So you were in trouble. Um, in 1969, the, the team would move to the newly created AL East after the league expanded. So now, rather than being in the AL, they're in the AL East. You know, it's just because they split up the AL to the AL East and the AL West at this point. Um, the team would struggle mightily in the 1969 season, going 62-99. and 99. And they would actually trade pitcher Luis Tiant after the season. So no penance in the 1960s. Now we get to the 1970s. And um, after two more rough seasons in the 70 and 71 season, including a 60 and 102 record in 1971, ownership in Cleveland was approached by the executive director of New Orleans Superdome, the same Superdome that we know of today. So Vernon Stouffer actually reached an agreement to play 30 games a season in New Orleans for 25 years. But the AL voted it down. So Stouffer said, okay, I'm done. And he sold the team um, months later. So Stouffer had later said that owning the team was, quote, the longest five years of my life, end quote. He had a heck of a time owning that team. Um, so they would acquire pitcher Gaylord Perry before the 1972 season. And we have an infamous moment here. Um, on June 4th, 1974, when they had the infamous 10 cent beer night. So Cleveland ownership had an idea and they had been doing this for a while now, but they would host a beer night. They would host a night in which they would offer 12 ounce cup of cups of beer for only 10 cents a pop. Now you could buy six cups at once, but they didn't tap you. So you could hypothetically buy six cups of beer and give them to your girlfriend or, you know, your friend who doesn't want to drink, designate driver, have them sit down, and then you could go back to another line, grab a and do the same thing, and you could walk out with 24 cups of beer or 18 cups of beer or whatever and drink it all. And there was no cap. So the problem was normally it was okay. But um, what happened was a week prior to this game, Cleveland and their opponent for this game – during the infamous 10 cent beer night was the Texas Rangers. And those two teams had engaged in a bench clearing brawl. Now this game was in Texas. 
So this left some fans in Cleveland upset. And Rangers manager at the time, Billy Martin, was asked about the uh, Cleveland team, and he poured gasoline on the fire when he said, you know, he wouldn't, you know, he was asked if uh, he would take his armor to Cleveland, and he said, quote, nah, they won't have enough fans to worry about, end quote. So it was pretty alarming. Cleveland fans got very mad, and a lot of well-known, you know, radio hosts, everything, were pouring more and more gasoline on the fire. But I said, we need to go after Texas. We need to show them that we have a fan base. And again, it didn't work that it was on 10 cent beer night. So over 25,000 fans would show up to this game, which is double the amount that they had anticipated. And the Rangers took an early lead. And from there, the, the problems began. So a woman would w- run onto the Cleveland on deck circle and would flash everybody. Then a man would streak across the field to second base. Shortly after that, a father and a son would run into the outfield and they would moon all the fans. And um, the Rangers' first baseman, he was constantly being pelted with food, mostly hot dogs, and he was spit on by the fans. So after the Rangers complained about a call, um, the fans got even more upset, and they started to throw lit firecrackers into the Rangers' bullpen. So the, so the uh, Cleveland team ends up rallying, and they tie the game at five in the ninth inning, and things get out of hand. So another fan storms the field, and he tries to steal a Rangers outfielder's hat. You know, just a drunk guy being stupid. Nothing really crazy. So the uh, Rangers outfielder kind of gets defensive, and he steps back, and he ends up tripping. Now, from what everybody saw in the Rangers dugout, it looked like the uh, fan had pushed him or had punched him or something. So Billy Martin, of course, manager of the Rangers, runs out with a bat, and all his players follow him, and they're ready to fight the fans. So, some, some, like I said, um, some of the fans were armed with bats, or some of the players were armed with bats, and in a large number of fans would say, hey, they're going after one of our guys. So, about 200 fans poured into the field immediately, and they surrounded the 25-man team. And the Cleveland uh, manager at the time realized that the Rangers were in trouble, and he actually would order his players to go help the Rangers. Now, keep in mind, these two teams don't like each other, but it's kind of like, listen, there are their fellow players, their fellow major league players. If we were in this position, we'd want them to do the same for us. We got to stand up for our fellow man. So they, they did, they came back. And so at this point, it's like 50 guys versus 200 plus fans because more and more fans were pouring into the field. So a few of the, a few fights would break out between fans and players, but nothing really, really serious. Um, Believe it or not, an actual the only major injury reported for a player was when a Cleveland Indians, um, I believe it was a relief pitcher, he gets hit in the face with a with a chair, a folding chair that a fan threw. I don't know if he was aiming for him or what, but that's what happens. Um, so fans would tear up the field after the players left. They went they went to try to chase after the uh, Rangers players. They didn't really want to fight their own team, but they kind of did because their team was throwing punches at them. And um, they tried to chase him. They got the, they locked themselves away in the clubhouse, and the Rangers actually got escorted out by the Cleveland team to their team bus, and they left. Um, so fans, like I said, would tear up the field in response, and they stole the bases. So in response, this game was called in the Texas Rangers' favor, and the fans actually got really pissed off at the umpire for calling the game, so they actually started attacking the umpires, and this actually led to the head umpire, the crew chief at the time, saying this was the worst game he ever affiliate he ever you know officiated and uh you know police would arrive after 20 minutes and nine fans were arrested now that's the end of 10 cent beer night they would actually continue to do it in the future but they put more limitations they said only two beers per person and they actually started marking your id or putting something on your hand or whatever so you couldn't keep getting all these beers so they learned their lesson they learned their lesson um, in late 1974, outfielder Frank Robinson was actually traded to the Cleveland team, and they would name Frank Robinson player manager before the 1975 season. So he officially became Major League Baseball's first black manager. That was something he wanted, and that's why he was traded to Cleveland. So again, this team is pretty progressive. Um, pitcher Dennis Eckersley makes his MLB debut in early 1975. 
And in June of 1975, the team would actually trade pitcher Gaylord Perry. So basically, Gaylord Perry kept clashing with Frank Robinson, and the team decided to side with uh, Robinson in this situation. So after the 1976 season, Frank Robinson would retire as a player, and midway through the 1977 season, he was actually fired after a slow start from his manager role. After 1977, Dennis Eckerly was actually traded to the Boston Red Sox, where he would become a Hall of Fame pitcher. Um, the team was average to close out the 1970s, so nothing great. No pennants in the 70s. Real quick decade in the 80s. So the team still failed to see much success in the 1980s. Um, they remained towards the bottom of the American League East through the decade. Um, ownership would change hands again in the 1986 season. And the team had its best season of the decade that year in 86, going 84 and 78. Just to tell you how bad they were, that's barely over 300, uh, 500. So the team made the cover of Sports Illustrated that year. Uh, a couple of players on the team did, I should say. And a couple of the players on that team predicted that the team would win the AL East the following year, 1987. Now, if you Google 1987 MLB season, you look at the standings, you're going to keep scrolling till you get to Cleveland. Cleveland had the MLB worst record, 1987, 61 and 101. So, yeah, needless to say, those players regret saying what they said. Uh, no pennants in the 1980s. So, um, in before the 1990 season, the team would acquire catcher Sandy Alomar Jr. from the Padres. And during the 1990 season, uh, pitcher Charles Nagy would make his debut for the team. In May of 1990, uh, the voters in Cleveland uh, voted to pass a, a tax on alcohol and cigarettes with the proceeds going towards new stadiums for Cleveland's Major League Baseball and NBA teams. And the new MLB stadium would be would place uh, Cleveland Stadium, which was beginning to fall apart. So, like, chunks of concrete would be falling from certain areas in Cleveland Stadium. Um, it was just too old. It was too much to repair. So they needed, they wanted a new stadium. They didn't want to lose their team. So they made everything. And they, they would name the stadium uh, Jacobs Field. So they would hire uh, Mike Hargrove, to be the manager before the 1991 season. During the 1991 season, first baseman designated hitter Jim Tomey would make his debut for the team. And the team would trade for outfielder Kenny Lofton before the 1992 season. Baseball America would actually name the Cleveland team Organization of the Year in 1992. Um, future, the future was definitely looking bright for Cleveland. So before the 1993 season, during spring training, there was another tragic moment in Cleveland history. So three pitchers were out on a lake drinking and having fun. And as they returned home, their boat would crash into a pier. So two of the players, Steve Olin and Tim Cruz, would actually die. And the third player, who, again, wasn't too relevant, he would retire after he played a little bit in that season. And then the next year, he would play a little bit. and He didn't do that good. And he would retire, mostly in part due to the injuries. So... Um, so at this point, too, in 1993, outfielder Manny Ramirez would make his debut for the team. Um, they would move to Jacobs Field prior to the 1994 season, and they would acquire outfielder Dave Winfield for a dinner. You might be saying, what? So during the 94 season, there was a strike, and it wipes out the playoffs. So basically, um, Cleveland had agreed to a deal with Minnesota Twins, for, to trade David Winfield for a player to be named later. Now, this was after the strike had started, but they didn't think the strike was going to wipe out the season. So, basically, no season met the player to be named play, later would be nobody. And in response, basically what they did is the executives from Cleveland and the executives from Minnesota just hung out. They went to a dinner, and the Cleveland executives covered the bill. Just a little interesting side note there. Dave Winfield got traded for a dinner. Um, so... In 1995, the team would make the playoffs for the first time since 1954. Keep in mind, you know, the first 15 years of that, there was only one team in the American League that would make the playoffs. That's still a pretty long stretch. So they would win the American League, you know, the ALDS, American League Divisional Series, in the ALCS. But in the World Series, they would fall in six games to the Atlanta Braves, giving Atlanta its only World Series victory in five or six tries in the 90s. So fans were very excited you know, about this, and they had sold all their home tickets for the 1996 season before 
opening day. So just just to show you how excited the fans were. Um, they would win the American League Central, but they lost in the ALDS in 96. And in 1997, uh, outfielder Kenny Lofton would spend that season in Atlanta, but he would return for the 1998 season. But he didn't miss him that much in 97. So Bartolo Colon would make his debut in 97 for the team, and they would actually make the World Series in 1997. And they made it to Game 7. So here we are, Game 7. And the team has a 2-1 lead in the ninth inning. But they would go on to lose that game to the Florida Marlins. This is known as two outs away because, you know, there were two outs away from winning the World Series. And it caused a lot of rifts between players. So certain guys no longer wanted to talk to each other. They blamed each other for it. Um, the closer really took a lot of heat for it. So in 1998, again, like I said, Kenny Lofton returned. And the team fell to the elite New York Yankees in the playoffs that year. The 1999 offense um, scored over 1,000 runs. Now, they're the only team since the 1950 Red Sox to do so. That stands to date, which is kind of crazy. So they would fall to the Red Sox in the ALDS that year. In response, they would fire manager Mike Hargrove after the season, and that really pissed off a lot of fans. But basically, there were some management problems where he apparently started guys on short rest that the uh, ownership thought he shouldn't have. So, so they won uh, the one AL pennant that year in the uh, 90s, but they did not win the World Series. Um, now we're in the 2000s, and they played well in 2000 but missed the playoffs. After the 2000 season, outfielder Manny Ramirez and catcher Sandy Alamara, Alamara Jr. would both leave the team via free agency. Of course, Manny Ramirez, as we know, would go to the Red Sox. Um, he would go on to have a PED career, somewhat successful. So from in, in uh, 2001, pitcher CeCe Sabathia would make his MLB debut. And from 1995, so 2001, the team would actually sell out 455 consecutive home games. That was a record that stood for a while until the Red Sox broke it uh, relatively recently. So on August 5th, 2001, the team would rally from a 14-2 to 2 deficit to beat Seattle. This is the largest comeback in Major League Baseball history. So after the 2001 season, uh, outfielder Kenny Lofton would leave in free agency. And in 2002, the team fell out of contention. So they would trade pitcher Bartolo Colon for a package that included pitcher Cliff Lee and uh, second baseman Brandon Phillips and two other players. So this is considered one of the best trades in uh, Major League Baseball history. One of the better trades, I should say, in Major League Baseball history. So the team would also acquire outfielder Coco Crisp in the trade deadline. After 2002, pitchers Charles Nagy and first baseman Jim Tomey both left via free agency, and the team struggled in 03 and 04. Um, they played well in 2005, but would miss the playoffs. They would trade Coco Crisp to the Boston Red Sox after the 05 season, and in 2007, the team would make the playoffs again, but they lost in the ALCS. Um, the Jacobs Field is renamed to Progressive Field in 2008 after Progressive you know, buys the name rights to the stadium. And in July of 2008, the team would trade pitcher CC Sabathia for a package that was headlined by outfielder Michael Brantley. And in another deal, they would acquire catcher utility man Carlos Santana. So the team was sold. The team sold most of its good players, I should say, in the 2009 era because they weren't competitive. They weren't good enough, which included them sending Cliff Lee to the Philadelphia Phillies, for a package that was headlined by modern day pitcher still on the team, Carlos Carrasco, who we all know, you know, had his battle with uh, cancer last season. So just a little story there, a little feel good story. Um, they did not win any pennants in the 2000s. So now I get to the 2010s. And the team, the team would start off the decade with two bad years and then an average 2012. Um, pitcher Corey Kluber would make his debut in 2011. And before 2013, they would hire manager Terry Francona. So the team played well with Francona, making the playoffs for the first time in a little bit um, in 2013, but they lost in the wild card play-in. 
So the team did well in 2015, 2014, 2015, but they don't make the playoffs. You know, Detroit's still dominant at this point. Kansas City's still doing really good at this point. So in mid-2015, shortstop Francisco Lindor would make his MLB debut. And in 2016, the team would cruise into the playoffs and would make the World Series for the first time since the 2000s, or since the 90s, sorry, since the 1995 season. And um, 1997 season, sorry, 1997 season. And uh, they would lose to the Chicago Cubs. Now, if you're watching this video, there's a very good chance that you remember the 2016 World Series. I was torn on who to root for because I wanted to see both teams' streaks end. I ended up going for the Cubs, but uh, it, it's just such an interesting one. Um, both sides were had these really long World Series list streaks. So either way, we knew we were going to have a good team that deserved to win the World Series, win the World Series. And fortunately, the Cubs won, you know, unfortunately for the Indians team, but fortunately for the Cubs team. It was a heartbreaking Game 7. So here we are in 2017, and the Indians would actually win an AL record 22 consecutive games from August 24th to September 15th. Now, this momentum didn't really carry on to the playoffs, and they would actually lose in the ALDS. So Carlos Santana would leave the team in 2018, um, and the, the team would make the ALDS in 2018 again, but would lose. And in 2019, the team would reacquire Carlos Santana. Interesting side. He went to the Phillies for a season, gets traded to the Seattle Mariners for uh, – uh, uh, why am I blanking on his name there? Uh, shortstop, but uh, Gene Segura, shortstop Gene Segura. And then he gets traded right after that to the Cleveland team right away. So Michael Brantley would leave the team after 2018 as well. Now he would go to sign with the Houston Astros. Unfortunately, that wasn't a good move for him. Uh, we all know what's going on with the Astros now. And the team would play well in 2019, but they missed the playoffs. And they would actually trade pitcher Corey Kluber after the 2019 season in a bit of a salary dump. Now he had been injured in 2019, so he was ineffective. So... The Cleveland franchise has won six AL pennants in its history and won two World Series, the, actually the first two trips they made to the World Series, 1920 and 1948. Uh, fortunately for them, Bill Beck did get that World Series in 1948. Interestingly enough, in 1949, when they, when they got eliminated from the playoffs, they did bury their AL pennant like flag in the outfield. So you could say that's a bit of a curse, but... Who knows? Um, so 27 people with ties to this team are inducted in the Hall of Fame, which, of course, includes guys like Bob Feller, um, Nap LaJoy, of course, Cy Young. So um, they have 10 retired numbers. Now, one of them, of course, is number 42, Jackie Robinson. Eight of them are players. One of them is an interesting number. So of those 10 retired numbers, we have number three, Earl Averill. Number five, Lou Boudreau. Number 14, Larry Doby. Number 18, Mel Harder. Number 19, Bob Feller. Number 20, Frank Robinson. Number 21, Bob Lemon. Number 25, Jim Tomey. Number 42, like I said, Jackie Robinson. And number 455 for the fans, which again, 455 is to tell you the number of games that they sold out consecutively. So just a cool little shout out to their fan base. But that is the history of the Cleveland MLB franchise. Um, in the 1990s, they did win two AL pennants, not one. I realized that after I said it. So that is me correcting that mistake. Um, again, I do apologize if you find the name Cleveland Indians offensive. I tried to cut it down as much as I could. I am part Native American. So, you know, it is what it is to me. Um, but yeah, that's the history of the franchise. Um, again, I know the video was supposed to come out on Thursday, but schedule change made it so it can come out today. Um, I'm going to use this time to just say next week we will not have a history of video. I just have to catch up on my notes. I'm a little behind. So I'm just using this moment to tell you guys that um, they, the series will be back for the week starting on, what would that be, the 19th, July 19th. We will have the series back. I just need a little break to do more research. Um, I basically, you know, my notebook's pretty much cleaned up right now. Um, I might try, if the opportunity presents itself, I might try to do, like, 
the Boston Red Sox. That one's good to go, but I just kind of want to catch up on the rest of the AL East before I jump in and do another video. Um, I will explain it again in our live stream on Friday, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, have a great rest of your day, everybody. And yeah, that's it. Um, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, definitely comment. I mentioned a couple things, you know, I will mention the saga of, of Napa Joy, especially in the Phillies video and the athletics video. So that's something that if you want to hear it, definitely look into it. Um, I will probably do a video for Phil Vex, but yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Sarah, heading out for the day. Have a good one, guys.